الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين وأصحابه الطاهرين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسرة حسنة صدق الله العظيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى في شان حبيبه مخبرا وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله الفاتحة إلى روح النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين برحمتك يا رب Alhamdulillah Ta'ala, we are gathered here to undertake the study of Shamayr al-Tirmadhi, which is a compendium of narrations regarding the physical attributes of the Prophet وسلم, and his uh, qual- his qualities, his various different inner um, attributes as well. I've been, I was asked if I'm going to be doing an introduction. Unfortunately, with it being a six week course or a six week deadline, I'm going to try and jump straight into the book uh, without a detailed introduction. And hopefully, the book itself will become an introduction for you. Um, I don't have the luxury, uh, in, in six weeks, um, I want to cover as much of the actual text as possible. Um, Imam Abu Isa Tirmidhi, he has created this book. <coughs> Regarding the book itself, Mullah Ali Ghali, Ali Rahma, a very famous scholar and muhaddith, you know, his name sort of resonates throughout the Islamic world. And he's, uh, what he stated about this book is absolutely amazing. And he said that this is possibly the greatest work that has been authored regarding the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, especially his physical appearance and his characteristics. And the way he phrased it is absolutely uh, amazing. He said, when you read this book, through every chapter it will appear to you as if you are beholding the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're actually, you know, it will feel that you are seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of you. And unfortunately, because, you know, we live in a time where we're not blessed with the physical company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has not bestowed this honor upon us. However, we owe a debt of gratitude to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who have given us descriptions in as much detail as they possibly could regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's physical appearance as well as his characteristics. But we owe a debt of gratitude to his companions for relaying this information to us. And then Imam Abu Isa Tirmazi for collating this information and gathering this information and presenting it before us in the form of his book, Shamayl. And Shamayl, again, just it, it refers to the characteristics, physical or inner characteristics, of the Prophet. So this is what we're going to be studying in the coming six weeks, inshallah. <coughs> Imam Abu Isa um, it's not a promise depending on um, you know, where we're up to at the end. 
if I have time, if we have time, and if uh, we can make time, maybe in the last session, once we've covered what we can of the book, um, I may give you a brief uh, biography of Imam Abu Isa Tirmidhi. So, but initially, all you need to know, he is one of the six Imams whose books are known as Siha al Sitta, the six authentic compilations of prophetic traditions, namely Sahih Bukhari, uh, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Nasai, Sunan al Nasai, and Sunan Tirmidhi. So he's one of those six authors whose books are referred to as Siha al Sitta, the six most authentic compilations of Ahadith. Very, very highly regarded amongst the <coughs> scholars of Hadith. His compilation, his Sunan al Tirmidhi, which is from amongst the six most authentic collections of Ahadith, is regarded as one of the greatest collections of Hadith. So a very, very great Muhadith in his own rights. And he's compiled this shorter collection of Ahadith, this smaller collection, which he's named the Shamayl, which refer to the physical and inner characteristics of the Prophet and he begins this book, the very first chapter in this book. There is a, a very beautiful, um, very eloquent English translation uh, available, which is this one here. Um, and I'll leave this here on the desk uh, if any of you want to um, note it down. And this is something that you will, inshallah, now if we don't get through the whole book, then this is something that you can read through. Um, in your own time and finish in your own time as well. But we begin today in the first chapter, which is entitled by Imam Tirmidhi as a descriptions, physical descriptions of the physical features of the Prophet. So the the Hulia, the physical form and characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is what he begins with. And the very first narration that he mentions is from Sayyidina Anas bin Malik ta'ala. This is a very great Sahabi companion of the Prophet ﷺ, very famous amongst the companions. And it's amazing. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Marina Munawwara after the migration, people came with their gifts and to welcome the Prophet ﷺ, and people bringing all sorts of different gifts to present to the Prophet ﷺ on this occasion of his arrival in Medina. Now, Sayyidina Anas, his mother, and you know, he's from a humble family didn't really have an extravagant gift to give to the Prophet So she brought along Sayyidina Anas holding his hand, young child, brought him along to the Prophet and she said, Ya Rasulullah, this, this is my gift to you. you. He will serve you and he will, he will become your servant and this is my gift to you. Can you imagine that? Uh, it is difficult to imagine a mother doing that. You know, um, we know this is the Prophet and this is what tells us how great the attachment of the Sahaba and the companions was to the Prophet For those of you who are parents, um, think about yourself, you know, one of your children, giving up your, your children in that manner. Um, not an easy thing to do, but it was easy. Why? Because this was the Prophet And then in return, the Prophet he showered him with such love and affection that Sayyidina Anas ta'ala, he says, in all the years that I served the Prophet wasallam, never once did he say to me, why did you do this? Or why didn't you do this? Now this is sort of the, the, this is the love and affection that he saw um, from the Prophet wasallam. He narrates his first hadith and he, he tells us about the physical form of the Prophet wasallam. And he says, the Messenger of Allah, 
was not extremely tall, nor was he short. And just as a just to lay down a foundation for this, is something that we've been that I've been through in detail uh, during Juma and during Ramadan as well. In one of the talks during Ramadan, I mentioned this in detail, and I told you that you know we're familiar with three questions of the grave: Man Rabbuka, Ma Dinuka, Ma Kunta Taqulu Fi Hakti Hazar Rajul. We know uh, these three questions. You know, who is your Rabb? Who is your Lord? What is your theme, your religion, and what do you say, or what did you used to say about this person, showing an image of the, or the Prophet وسلم, being present? They will ask about the Prophet وسلم, the two angels. And it's not that I, do, I negate that there's three questions, and these three questions are recorded in a hadith, this is where they're taken from, but there is not one single narration in Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari which mentions three questions. Not one. The only narration that is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim and mentioned again and again, there's one particular narration which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari 11 times. 11 times with different chains of narration, different people narrating. Imam Bukhari, he mentions that narration under different titles and chapters 11 times. And in that narration, the Prophet وسلم, says, and this is narrated by Sayyidah Asma, Radiallahu an, daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala an, Sayyidina Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, she <coughs> narrates this hadith, and she says that after praying nafal, I'm sort of abbreviating here, I'm abridging, but uh, after praying some units of nafal, um, the Prophet sallallahu sort of stood and he delivered a sermon. He praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he said, Ma bin shayin, there is absolutely nothing that I was not shown, or I had not seen, I had not witnessed up until now, but it has been shown to me standing here today. Absolutely everything. Even the Prophet says, even Jannah and Jahannam, even Paradise and the Hellfire. And the Prophet then went on to say, he said, every single one of you will be tested in the grave. What is the test? The Prophet ﷺ said, each and every one of you will be asked, مَا عِلْمُكَ بِهَازَ الرَّجُلِ Not what did you used to say about this person, but what is your knowledge of this person? What do you know of Rasulullah ﷺ? Your salvation depends on your answer to that question. The question is, what do you know of this person? What do you know of Rasulullah But truly, your salvation depends, because remember, judgment begins here. This is why the Prophet said, judgment begins. When someone asked him, when is judgment day? He said, your judgment begins the moment you die. This is where the judgment begins. And what does it depend on? It depends on your knowledge of the Prophet and whether you're able to answer this question or not. Those who are sincere believers, they will answer immediately. They will say, they will say who are Muhammad He is Muhammad Who are Rasulullah? He is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He came to us with clear signs and guidance. So we accepted and we followed. Who are Muhammad? Muhammad Muhammad This is going to be their response. So just think of that as a foundation. I mean, I'm not implying that you're studying or someone's studying this you know, automatically gives them the answer in the grave, but it's a start. You, know, you need to develop an attachment with the Prophet ﷺ in order to answer that question correctly. The actual, what is being tested there is your attachment with the Prophet ﷺ. This is what your salvation depends on. And how can you form this attachment with something which to you is majhul, which you have no knowledge of? Yeah, majhul means you know, something that you don't know anything about. How can you form an attachment with the Prophet if you know nothing about him? So your attachment is what is going to uh, get you through the test. 
And you, in order to build that attachment, you need to know of the Prophet So this first hadith narrated by Sayyidina Anas bin Malik, the first thing he says is that the Prophet was neither tall nor short. So the question that arises there is, we know in certain narrations it tells us that the Prophet وسلم, whenever he was in a large crowd or large gathering he would appear to be the tallest he stood out now when you have a large gathering of people you have people of different heights but out of all of them the Prophet وسلم, stood out and he appeared to be the tallest and yet the Sahaba they say that he was of medium height. He wasn't too, he was shorter than, very short. In, in one hadith which is coming up, you will see, this is how it's described. He's shorter than the very tall and taller than the short. So in between. How is that possible? Well, this is a miracle that was granted to the Prophet ﷺ by Allah subhanahu wa In that, in his actual stature, the Prophet ﷺ was of medium height. No, his, his act, sorry? What is medium We're not given sort of a measurement in, in, in feet and inches. And I mean, this is the best that, that's given, the description that is given to us is medium height. Um, something that doesn't, you know, someone who doesn't, when you look at them, appear to be short or um, extremely tall. So we, we aren't really given a real uh, something to compare with in that sense or a, a, a measurement in, in feet or inches. This is how the Sahaba, they described the Prophet وسلم, is of medium uh, height. Um, and the thing about the, the miracle was that being of medium height, the actual stature of the Prophet وسلم, being medium, when he was in a large gathering, he appeared to be the tallest amongst them. He stood out amongst them. And this was the miracle granted to the Prophet ﷺ by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that Imam Ahmad Raza, he makes reference to in one of his uh, beautiful couplets as well. He says, Sari uncho me uncha samajiye jise. You perceive him to be the tallest of all those who are tall. So amongst tall people, you perceive him to be the tallest. Our Prophet is even taller than him. Talking here, not only, not only of his physical, this miracle that amongst a group he would appear the tallest, but also with regards to the Prophet Wasallam's rank, you know, far outranking anybody else um, in the creation. So um, this is something that Imam Ahmad Raza, he makes a reference to as well. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik the first thing that the Prophet وسلم, was neither tall nor short. And he was neither extremely pale nor sort of uh, dark skinned. So he was in between. Um, not too tall, not too short, not too fair skinned, not too dark skinned. And the blessed hair of the Prophet وسلم, was neither curly nor straight. It wasn't curly all the way through, it wasn't straight all the way through, uh, wavy if you like, or slightly curly hair in between. And in this particular narration, Sayyidina Anas he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned him Allah with divine revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, sent him the first revelation and the birsa of the Prophet ﷺ occurred at the age of 40. And he remained in Mecca for a further 10 years, and in Medina for 10 years. And the Prophet ﷺ left this world, physically departed from this world at the age of 60. And you might, you might have heard something different about the age of the Prophet ﷺ. What, what do you normally hear? 63. The answer to that is, it generally in speaking, um, especially in, in the Arab culture and so on, generally, um, sort of the extra numbers are rounded, 
down or rounded up. And so, you know, when it says 10 years in Mecca after the Bi'tha, um, it, you know, it doesn't include the extra couple of years, it just rounds it into 10 years. So round numbers, basically 40 years up to Bi'tha, 10 years, a decade after the Bi'tha, a decade in Medina. And so giving you a round figure. So it's not that those narrations are incorrect, those are uh, more widely accepted and there are more of them. But this one, one way of understanding is that it's just giving you uh, round figures and giving you uh, sort of round numbers to, um, as was uh, customary. This is the description. Um, he says that he, at, at, at the time there were no more than 20 hairs in the Prophet Wasallam's blessed head and beard that had turned white. So this is when the Prophet Wasallam passed away physically, departed from this world. By that time, there were no more than 20 hairs on the Prophet Wasallam's head or his beard that had turned white. Inshallah, this is something which we mention in a bit more detail, but it actually there's a separate chapter discussing the Prophet Wasallam physically aging and getting older. And this will be discussed separately in that chapter. But the um, thing to remember is the reference to the beard, which is something that I'm going to um, come to shortly. That it, you know, there is re a reference made to the beard of the Prophet in that description. In the description of Sayyidina Ali, which is coming up, you know, he clearly states that the Prophet's beard was thick and you know, covered um, his, his, his neck and down to his chest. Um, this is how Sayyidina Anas bin Malik and he describes the beauty of the Prophet There's something that I want you to bear in mind here, and that is how to define beauty. How do you know if something is beautiful? Because remember, you know, you have this the, the, the famous sort of phrase in English, um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, beauty is as someone someone who's watching and who sees something as he perceives it, that is beauty. Is that the definition of beauty? How do you you know we say that the Prophet was the most beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa the supreme creation of Allah subhanahu wa And just to give you a quick example here, also relate to the verse that I recited in my introduction, which was, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنٌ Indeed, in the life of the Messenger of Allah, there is a beautiful example for you. But Allah talking about the seerah of the Prophet and his life, including his physical characteristics and his inner characteristics. Now, why? How can we derive the perfection um, that was Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam from that verse? It's simple. Just an example for your understanding. In no way, sort of, you know, putting this in parallel or in relation to Allah subhanahu wa taala. But for your understanding, you know, humans in their nature are also um, manufacturers or creators, if you like, they make things. When you make something, what is the process of, of manufacture? Especially, this is more relevant in our modern sort of culture. When someone <coughs> makes a new product, a new invention, there's the process that he goes through. And just sort of summing that up briefly, the first thing is he needs to make a working prototype of that product you know, to ensure that it actually works. After ensuring that it works, that person will then build samples for marketing purposes to actually see whether it's a viable project or not. And if the marketing fails, you know, if those samples that he's created, if they fail, then he needs to go back and either scrap the idea or rethink it and you know, bring it back again to the marketing stage where he can make a success out of it. So it all hinges upon those samples that are sent out for the purposes of marketing. Now, as a, as a human, as a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person makes something and he builds these samples, guaranteed he will try his utmost 
to have those samples absolutely perfect. Why? Because his whole production of that product, potentially millions and billions of that product, depend on how those samples turn out and how the sort of, you know, what the um, experience is with the marketing of those samples. As a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person, his highest priority is that the samples have to be perfect. Why? Because once it's gone through the marketing stages, you know, he's got his sponsors and he's got all his financial support and everything, and he's ready to go to the manufacturing stage, if there are problems there, well, this is why the manufacturers offer their warranties and so on. Right? If there's a fault in the product, they'll, they'll reclaim it and they'll, and they'll fix it. It doesn't actually affect the business as a whole. It doesn't affect the product as a whole. The success of the product actually hinges initially on the samples at the marketing stage for it to go any further. This is, as a human, as a person, this is something that you can relate to. Now, completely putting that out of your mind, because never assimilating anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but now taking you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supreme creator, the creator of everything, and he who created the universe without any samples, without any blueprints, without any prototype, he said, Kun, be, and it became. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's creating an example, he's creating a sample, someone for us to follow, guidance for the whole of mankind from the moment that he announces his prophethood up until the end of time. Anyone who comes, the Prophet ﷺ, is a minaret of guidance for that person. Just as much today, 1400 years on, as he was when he was amongst the Sahaba with his physical being in this world. So, and will be until the day of judgment. Is it possible then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supreme creator, whose creation is that he wills something into existence. Put it simply, he simply wills something into existence. When he wants something to exist, it exists. He is creating a sample. A sample who's going to guide his people from 1400 years ago up until the day of judgment. Can you imagine or perceive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supreme creator, who wills things into existence, would leave room for faults within his sample? Right? This is how you can derive perfection from that verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uswatun hasan. You have a beautiful example perfect example in the life, in the seerah of the Prophet And he truly was perfect. The Prophet was perfection personified in his physical being, in his inner characteristics, in every manner and every respect, the Prophet was perfection. Now coming back to that point, how do you define beauty? How do you define perfection? Well, the Arabs, they have their own way of defining beauty and perfection. And if I'm honest with you, I haven't come across a better definition of beauty and perfection in all my studies, in anything that I've ever come across. I've never come across a better definition. And I think you, when, I, when I tell you, you will agree with me. The beauty and perfection is for all things to be in moderation. Alright? Beauty and perfection is for everything to be in moderation. Look at the descriptions of the Prophet Moderate, not too tall, not too short. Moderate. Not light, too light skinned, not dark skinned. Moderate. His hair, not too curly, not straight. Moderate. His nose not sort of too high, not too pointed. Moderate. Everything about the Prophet ﷺ, complete perfection. And completely 
in moderation. Yeah, so we, uh, some input from one of the sisters. There's something that is, you know, Western research um, also has come to, you know, similar conclusions that uh, <coughs> beauty is being average, being moderate, and when you measure the features, they will all be sort of average and moderate, and this is a type of beauty that will be universally acclaimed as beauty. So this is uh, this is how we begin with this description, physical description of the Prophet ﷺ by Sayyidina Anas The next hadith is also narrated by Sayyidina Anas and he says that the Prophet ﷺ was neither tall nor short and he had a handsome form. His hair was neither curly nor completely straight. His skin was radiant and when he would walk, he would lean forward slightly. Now this leaning forward slightly uh, you know, the, the Arabic term that is used, it has multiple meanings. Three different meanings, in fact. One would be that the Prophet was leaning for, used to lean forward slightly when he walked. The other would be that he walked at a brisk pace. He walked quickly. And the third meaning that it could have is that the Prophet walked with firm footing. And all three of these meanings, that such is the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ that every, whatever interpretation you take, it falls true on the Prophet ﷺ. He did walk slightly leaning forward. But what that means, what that actually means is that the Prophet ﷺ's gaze was lowered, whilst, even whilst walking. He didn't walk with his chest out, like, you know, as a mark of uh, often perceived as a mark of arrogance, the Prophet ﷺ was humble. Yeah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding his people in the Quran, rahmani ladina yamshuna ala al that the, the people of the Rahman, of the merciful, the people of Allah, the men of Allah are those who walk on the earth with humility. And this was uh, the Prophet ﷺ. Walking at a brisk pace? Yes, the Prophet ﷺ. There are narrations where the Sahaba would say, we would sometimes find it difficult to keep up with the Prophet ﷺ. Now, this is how brisk he walked. And also walking with firm footing, Sayyidina Ali ﷺ, and he says that the Prophet ﷺ would walk with firm footing, firmly grounding his feet, as if he was walking down an incline. And walking uh, down uh, something that declines, a mountain or you know, um, walking down um, an incline. So all three of this is, you know, this is the beauty of the Prophet <laughs> that all three possible meanings of the, that, that phrasing actually are true for the Prophet ﷺ, whichever one you take. Sayyidina Bara bin Azib he says that the Prophet ﷺ was a man of moderate stature. The space between his shoulders was broad, and his hair would fall from his blessed head and reached his earlobes. Now you'll see in another narration it says down to the shoulders. But this is natural, hair grows, it doesn't remain static. So this is what the commentators of the Ahadith, they have said that when the Prophet ﷺ's hair was short, the shortest length was the earlobes. And the longest length that, he ever, uh, that it ever was, was down to the shoulders. Coincidentally, you know, this, is, these are, this is the limit down to the shoulders. This is the limit and possibly this is where the limit is derived from by the Fuqaha is any longer for a man is haram. Why? Because it then becomes, uh, he's then, uh, so it becomes similar to the female form. And trying to assimilate for a female the male form and for a male the female form is haram. So this is the, this is the cutoff point. 
um, you know, any shorter, and for a female, again, the same ruling, because then it resembles a man. Longer than that, and it's haram, because it resembles um, a female. So this is, this is the minimum from the earlobes and maximum down to the shoulders. And there is, you know, obviously there's one occasion, which is the, uh, you know, the occasion of the pilgrimage, where the Prophet sallallahu <coughs> alaihi wasallam did um, remove all of his hair. That's one occasion. But other than that, the Prophet sallallahu hair was always long. It was always from below, uh, from the earlobe down to uh, sometimes up to the shoulder. He was dressed, and it, on this occasion, he says, on this occasion when I saw him, the Prophet ﷺ was dressed in a red-colored garment, upper and lower garment. And he says, I have never seen, and it's amazing how he says, he, he doesn't actually say anyone. He doesn't say, I've never seen anyone more beautiful than the Prophet. He said, I have never seen anything more beautiful than the Prophet ﷺ. Right, basically, saying out of all the creation, one of, you know, of anything, any form, I have never seen anything more beautiful than the Prophet This is how he saw and he envisaged the Prophet And we've got about three minutes before Maghrib. Um, because of the, uh, we're going to have a break in between for Maghrib and if people are happy to come back, we can continue uh, for a short while, briefly, after, after Maghrib. Or we can conclude uh, early, before Maghrib. Then, so, most people, everybody okay to come back? The way we're going to do this, uh, the way we're going to do this is, if you can uh, join in with the first read your first Ramaz, and then read your two uh, sunnah muakkara and then come straight down so we can start as quickly as possible don't wait for the concluding dua just read your three farts and your two sunnah and come back down and we will conclude uh, and inshallah we'll try and conclude as close to uh, I know the time that was advertised was quarter past seven to quarter past eight I will try to finish as close to that as possible um, only just a few more narrations maybe 15-20 minutes after Maghrib inshallah we will conclude. But with it being only six weeks, I would encourage you to actually try and give it as much time uh, as possible. I can give you uh, more time if you want. It's all dependent on you. But I would encourage you to uh, give it a little more time if possible. The next piece is also narrated by Sayyidina Bara bin Azib and he says, I've never seen anyone whose hair reached their shoulders, dressed in red clothing, more beautiful than the Messenger of Allah subhanahu He's describing that same day. His hair rested on his shoulders. So there seems to be a little contradiction, but I've explained that to you. You know, it wasn't always uh, one length. It's the lowest point, the earlobes, and the longest point down to the shoulders. And the space between his shoulders was broad, and he was neither extremely short nor extremely tall. So, you know, he's, he's telling you about the Prophet Sallallahu build now as well. He had broad shoulders, which, you know, generally for men, are, is known as a sign of a strong build. <coughs> a strong build is someone with broad shoulders. And the Prophet Sallallahu features emanated this. You'll see this in, in other descriptions coming up as well, inshallah, that although moderate, the Prophet Sallallahu features emanated strength. Strong shoulders, strong broad shoulders, strong broad joints. Uh, and so on. So this is, you know, um, I hope it's building now. Um, and, you know, we can never imagine. How can you try to envisage perfection? You know, uh, it's, it's not possible. Um, but, you know, hopefully it's building some sort of a, a mental sort of picture for you. And inshallah, we'll, we'll try to build on this um, as, as much as we can. So I will reconvene. Um, after Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala 
didn't have any hair on his chest or abdomen. He had hair, some a small amount of hair, on his upper arms and his shoulders, and a thin line of hair from the chest down to the navel. And uh, one of the Sahabis, uh, one of the narrations that you see coming up shortly is that the, uh, he describes the Prophet as not having an excessive amount of hair. Um, so, and we come back to that point of beauty being proportionate. Yeah, beauty is for everything to be uh, proportionate, and this is how the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi body was. And Sayyidina Ali, he says when he would walk, again, he also describes this thing about leaning forward slightly, walking with humility. When he would walk, he would lean forward slightly, such that it was, it would appear that he was descending from an elevated plane. So basically that the Prophet ﷺ was walking downwards uh, on an incline. I did not see his like, neither before him nor after him. I, in other words, I never saw anyone like the Prophet ﷺ before him or after him. And this is generally, this is an expression of exaggeration. Now, when we say, never seen anything like that in my whole life, uh, it's, it's an expression of exaggeration. But here, this is a statement of fact. It is not an exaggeration. The Prophet ﷺ, there was none like the Prophet ﷺ. And this is something that Imam Manabi, he says that every person needs to have this belief. It is necessary for every mu'min, for every believer to hold the belief that the Prophet ﷺ in his physical form as well as his inner characteristics was absolutely unique. This is a statement of Imam Rabi. He says on an aqidah level, uh, from a, an aqidah perspective, it is necessary for every believer to have the aqidah and the belief that the Prophet, no one resembles the Prophet ﷺ, neither in physical form nor in, his, in terms of his inner characteristics. So this is something um, additional that Imam Manabi he mentions um, regarding the physical form of the Prophet ﷺ and this belief. And this is something that we pick up from a hadith and from other aima, from other imams as well. And this is a belief that the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah we hold. It is our belief that there is no other creation like the Prophet Even amongst the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the chosen ones, those who are the greatest out of his creation, even amongst them, the Prophet stands out as the Imam, as the leader, and the rest, his 
Muqtadi and followers. And we see this literally happening on the night of Mi'raj, where the Prophet is stood on the Musalla of Imamat, and behind him, the Anbiya, the Prophets and Messengers are stood praying behind him. He stands out as the Imam. How one way of this of expressing this, and this is something that um, the, many of the scholars and ulama have mentioned regarding the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, is that and Imam Nabhani he mentions this in his book Kujatullahi Al Al Alamin. He says that one of the Aqidahs, one of the beliefs of the Ahl Sunnah is that the Prophet وسلم, was given every single miracle that was given to any Prophet or Messenger. They were all collectively given to the Prophet وسلم, in similar or more clear forms, in the same way or better. And on top of this, the Prophet وسلم, had certain miracles <coughs> which were given only and only to him and to nobody else. None of the other prophets or messengers. And a, a, a prime example of this, the Mu'jiza, the miracle of Mi'raj, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet and his witnessing and beholding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that night. This is something which was reserved specifically for the Messenger of Allah, for his beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is what uh, Imam Manabi, he says that, this aqidah, this belief, this is not just something that Sayyidina Ali anh, he says here, this is an aqidah, a belief that every mu'min and every believer must have, that there is no one and there can be no one like the Prophet He is one and unique. Sayyidina Ibrahim bin Muhammad he narrates from Sayyidina Ali he was his, uh, he was a grandson of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu He narrates from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and he says that uh, he actually learned from the Prophet sallallahu uh, from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu regarding the physical form of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu he explained to him and he says that uh, the messenger of Allah was neither extremely tall nor extremely short. We see this uh, uh, sort of description being repeated. Um, but he was of moderate stature, his hair was neither curly nor was it completely straight, rather it was slightly curly you know, with a slight wave in it. He was not, he was neither sort of, uh, of large build and nor was his face extremely round. So the Prophet Prophet's face was not round and circular, it wasn't long and thin, it was in between, it was slightly uh, um, sort of round. And his complexion was white with a hint of redness in it. So not completely uh, fair skinned, not entirely, and not dark skinned either. The eyes of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were exceedingly black. Dark and black. His eyelashes long. The joints of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi were large and the space between his shoulders was broad. The Messenger of Allah did not have a profuse amount of hair, he had a thin line of hair on the chest down to running down to the navel. The hands and feet of the Messenger of Allah were fully fleshed. When he would walk, he would sternly lift his feet off the ground, not sort of dragging them and sliding them along the ground, as if he was descending from an elevated plane, where he would direct his attention towards something. He would do so with his entire body. Not sort of just um, looking, or not turning just the head, but turning his whole body to give that person his full attention. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the supreme creation, the best creation in physical form and in characteristics. In respect of akhlaq, of morals and conduct, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is perfect. In every aspect you can imagine, he is perfect. So this is perfect conduct. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ, it's amazing when you look at the, the Prophet ﷺ's conduct, and inshallah, you know, we will be looking at some of those chapters and those ahadith as well. The Prophet ﷺ, there was, there was a, a, a young woman in uh, Madina Munawwara who was, uh, she uh, suffered from insanity. She, she was. You know, she had no control of her her mind. She would 
take the Prophet وسلم, hold him by the hand and would sit him down and would sit there and, and he would sit and he would listen to her talking and he would wait until she was ready to leave. Mm. Now, this is someone who's insane. Imagine how you would react in that position. This is the Prophet وسلم, this is his morals and his conduct. On one occasion, a person came to the Prophet وسلم, he had a, sh a shawl around his neck, he grabbed hold of it and shook him firmly. The Sahabi who narrates, he says he shook him and he held him so tightly and this shawl was wrapped so tightly around the Prophet وسلم's neck that it, the, there was a broad sort of uh, uh, edge on that shawl which left an imprint on the Prophet وسلم's neck. This is how violently he shook the Prophet ﷺ. He came up to him, shook him with some force, and he said, Ya Muhammad ﷺ, give me from the wealth that Allah has given you. It's not your or your father's wealth, it's Allah's wealth. This was his manner of seeking, of demanding. Now imagine if someone came up to you, someone in a position of need, any random person, not even somebody that you know, this was just a random Bedouin that turned up. You're walking along the street, some random person in a position of need comes up to you, grabs you by the scruff of your collar and shakes you with some uh, force and says to you, give me this and this, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Allah. Think of how you would respond to that. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, he said, what if you were to be uh, avenged for what you've done. Now, what if you were to be avenged for what you've done? And he said, I know that you never respond to an unkind uh, gesture in the same manner. Yeah, I know that. I know you will never respond to me, to my gestures in the same manner. <coughs> you will never respond to an unkind gesture, gesture except with a noble and kind gesture. And so the Prophet ﷺ simply smiled and he instructed for the Sahaba. He had two camels and he said, give him, load onto his camels, onto one camel, grains and onto the other camel, dates, and give him what he wants. This is, you know, we see the conduct of Rasulullah ﷺ in this manner. And this is just one of those small things that uh, the Prophet ﷺ would turn fully to give that person, when who was talking to the Prophet ﷺ, giving him the sense that the Prophet is giving him his full attention. He's fully devoted his attention to that person, not that he's sort of, you know, preoccupied somewhere else and just... And you all, we've all been there, we all, we all know how, you know, how annoying it can be and how sort of uh, upsetting it can be when you're talking to somebody and he's sort of concentrating somewhere else and he's not really paying attention to you and you having to sort of uh, wonder whether he's actually listening or not. But the Prophet وسلم, whenever he spoke to somebody, fully facing them, giving them their full attention. Another one of these examples is coming up with the Prophet وسلم, he would be the first to say salam. You know, nowadays we think of this as a, as a matter of pride as who says salam first. He would always be the good person to say salam first. When he shook hands with somebody, he would not let go until they let go. And, and I tried this with one of my younger students, just a physical demonstration. I took hold of his hand and I started talking to him. I said, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? So I started to, and after about 10 seconds, he pulled his hand away. And I said, this is what I wanted to show you was that the Prophet وسلم, never did this. No matter who it was, it would always have to be the other person to pull his hand away first, never the Prophet ﷺ. This is how kind he was in his, in his manners, in his gestures. But anyway, moving on, he says that he, between his shoulders he had the seal of prophethood. This is a separate chapter, chapter number two in his book is the seal of prophethood. So I'm not going to go into any detail, inshallah, we've not got time to do it today. Um, next week, I will talk to you about that, and there's a, uh, an amazing discussion and an amazing uh, account of Sayyidina Salman Farsi, I want to talk to you about, about 
uh, you know, in, in light of one of the narrations, because he's the one who narrates the hadith regarding the Muhrir al-Mubad, regarding the seal of Prophet. And how he actually ended up seeing the seal of Prophet, how he started off in Persia, uh, Persia in Faris, and then his travels throughout the, the Arab <coughs> continent and the world, and then so, sort of um, coming to um, Medina, eventually ending up there as a slave and so on. So, uh, an amazing account, inshallah, go into that next week. But Sayyidina Ali, he just makes a reference to the seal of prophethood here as well. And he says that he, was the, he, he had the seal of prophethood between his shoulders and he was the last of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa last of all prophets. But this is not just something that, you know, um, the Quran states this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states this, his Sahaba and the whole Ummah until this day, you know, everyone is agreed on the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last Prophet and Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Denying this characteristic of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is kufr. And denying this, you can never be a believer. This is one of those uh, <coughs> attributes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is a necessity of faith. If someone does not believe in this, he is not a Muslim. The Prophet is the last Prophet and Messenger. No Messenger, no Prophet of any form, anyhow, will come after the Prophet Even Sayyidina Isa, when he returns, he will not return as a, prophet and messi- as, as a prophet and messenger propagating his own religion and sharia in that capacity. No. He will come to follow and to lead the ummah of the Prophet and to strengthen and fortify the, the sharia laid down the law, laid down by the Prophet So there is no prophet in any capacity, in any form, no prophet or messenger after the Prophet and he says that he was the most generous of people from the heart. I mean, I could talk about the Prophet Wasallam's generosity um, endlessly. But I've already given you an example of his kindness and his generosity. About how he treated that Bedouin who came and grabbed hold of him. And so I'm going to leave it at that. And most truthful of them in speech. So truthful, in fact, that Abu Jahl, the Fir'aun, the Pharaoh of this Ummah, the greatest enemy of the Prophet and of Islam, he was once asked, he said, do you really believe that Muhammad is lying? Do you believe that he's lying? Do you believe that he's not the Prophet and Messenger of Allah? And he said, this is a person that we've never ever known to lie. And I don't believe that he's lying. But the Quraysh and these people, his family, you know, the family of Abdul Muttalib, they are the custodians of the Kaaba, you know, they have all the status that, you know, everything that includes any status amongst our society, they already have it. Are they now going to have the status of a prophet and a messenger within them as well? What is that going to be for us? This was his response. He said, I believe, I don't believe that he's lying. But if I accept him as a prophet and messenger as well, what does that mean for us? The, the, this is how truthful the Prophet was. This is why he was known as a Salik and, and also his, his honesty and his trust, his being trustworthy, known as Al Amin. He was the most gentle in nature and the most noble in lineage. And you know, this is a again, it's a separate topic, the noble, the purity of the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu And inshallah, if I have the opportunity in the future, I will do uh, a couple of sessions just on the purity of the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because it requires uh, a bit of depth. Whoever saw him prior to becoming acquainted with him and acquainted with his huge attributes, his great attributes, would be, he would be left in awe, in, in shock, in amazement and trembling. You know, the, 
I, I'm struggling to find a word that actually defines the word rob. You know, rob is a slight, it, awe is, is the closest you'll get to it. Left in awe, in amazement, you know, it, it's, it's a mixture of emotions. Slight, you know, with a, a slight sense of fear, uh, a, a sense of not, you know, coming into uh, something for the first time, you know, being struck with absolute amazement and awe. This is Sayyidina Ali you know, says this is how he would be in front of the Prophet. He would become Mar'ub in front of the Prophet. But he says then whoever then recognized him, knew who he was, and met with him and had his company would instantly fall in love with him. He would love him dear more dearly than anything else. And whoever described him eventually came to the conclusion that I have never seen anyone like him before or after him. This is what Sayyidina Ali Rabi Rahman said. That's an amazing, that, just that part, that extra. That's something Qadi Ayaz Ali Rahman, he narrates in his Ashifa as well, this section from Sayyidina Ali. Say, whoever saw him for the first time, he was left in awe. And who then, whoever met him and held his company, he would start to love him. And then whoever described him, the only thing he could say, and look at how Sayyidina Ali is saying it, that he concluded, you know, he, he, there was no other way of encompassing the beauty of the Prophet It's not possible for anyone to encompass the beauty of the Prophet he would, the only thing he could say was, I've never seen anyone as beautiful as the Prophet either before him or after him. That was the only way of expressing how beautiful the Prophet This is an expression of a person who's lost for words, who doesn't know how to express himself. Sayyidina Hassan bin Ali ta'ala, he says that I asked my uncle Hind bin Abi Hala as he was amongst those who would describe the physical features of the Messenger of Allah regarding the physical descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ, why? For I desired that he describe the noble features for me that I may memorize them and thus he said, he then said he was magnificent in himself and was magnificent and greatly revered in the eyes of others. And then he gives a lengthy description of the Prophet ﷺ. Most of that has been covered before, it's just a repetition. But the main thing here being Sayyidina Ali radiallahu uh, Sayyidina Hassan bin Ali radiallahu he would have been a young child of seven or eight years of age when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And so he asked his uncle, his maternal uncle, he says, describe the Prophet ﷺ to me. I want to learn about him, I want to memorize his physical features and his characteristics. Why? To try to replicate them. So this is why you're here today, or this should be why you're here today. To try to replicate those features, not just to hear them and, and learn them, but to try to replicate them. And there isn't anything, there's something, to, I'm just going to mention, he says regarding the nose of the Prophet and the eyebrows, because everything else has been mentioned before. In this he says that his forehead was wide and he had beautiful arched and full eyebrows which did not meet in the middle. So there was a, a gap in the middle. And the eyebrows were, 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 were full and um, were arched. Between the two eyebrows there was a vein which would protrude slightly when the Prophet ﷺ was angered. And the, the Sahaba, the, this is quite amazing, they, they could sense that the Prophet ﷺ was happy and was angry simply through his expression. And a hadith comes to mind. On one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ, someone came to the Prophet ﷺ asking him for seeking help. And at that particular moment in time the Prophet had nothing physically, nothing in front of him to give that person. 
So he said to him, you know, everything he had that day, he already distributed amongst the poor. And he said to him, go to such and such person, tell him to give you whatever you need, and tell him that Rasulullah will pay you back. So effectively, he said to him, go and take a loan from that person in my name. And I'll pay off your debt. And I believe you see the Umar who was sat there, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you taking the trouble to go to these lengths? Now, surely Allah has not uh, made this compulsory upon you. If you don't, if physically, if there's nothing here, why are you going to, to all these lengths? And the Prophet ﷺ immediately became extremely upset. <coughs> and then there was another Sahabi sat there, and he said to, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, give as much as you want to whomever you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let you down. Give, give whatever you want to whomever you want. Allah will not let you down. And the Prophet then began to smile. And this, this Sahabi, then he says that the Prophet began to smile. And when he was smiling, his face was radiant like the full moon. This is, the, the, you know, it, again, we need to try and sort of uh, think about our lives in this perspective. How would we deal with something like that? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ going to these lengths. The re you, we need to get this realization. The basic thing is, we need to realize that this, everything that we have, ultimately comes from Allah and it belongs to Allah. They spend from that which we have provided for them. This is what you need to realize. This spending in the way of Allah is one of the greatest attributes of the muttaqin, of those who have taqwa. Their greatest, one of their greatest attributes. They spend in good times and in hard times. This is how the Quran describes those who have taqwa. Why? Because they know it comes from Allah. Ultimately, it's not yours. You might think I've worked for it. I'm paying the mortgage, I'm paying the, you know, the, the monthly installments on the car, I'm doing all of this, it, it's mine, no. Who's given you the health and the tawfiq to earn this? You know, that everything you have, you yourself and everything that you have belong to Allah and therefore you should never have any reservation when spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa This is a sign of those who have taqwa. It's not. Remember, the English phrase is, money is the root of all evil. I don't agree with that. Money isn't the root of all evil. What the Prophet ﷺ said is slightly different, but is extremely accurate. He said, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا رَأْسُ كُلِّ خَطِيَةٍ It is the love of the dunya that is the root of all evil. Not money, it's the desire and want and love for money which is the root of all evil. This is why we see many of the Sufiya, many of those awliya, those who close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had plenty of money. And yet they earned these stations. Why? Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala, was he short of money? Look at the status that he earned. Why? There was no love for that money. You know, he would be indifferent he would be indifferent whether that money was there or not. And so the Prophet ﷺ, his physical features, this vein in between the eyebrows, was something that gave the Sahaba an indication of when the Prophet ﷺ became angry. He had a beautifully rounded mouth, uh, he had a full beard. This is Sayyidina Ali now um, describing the Prophet. ﷺ. And his cheeks were not protruding had a beautifully rounded mouth and there was a gap in between the front of teeth of the Messenger of Allah. A thin line of hair ran from the chest, this is something that we've covered already, perfectly proportioned, neither uh, sort of uh, larger build nor skinny, and all body parts were pro proportionate to each other, and his stomach and chest were aligned with one another, yet his chest was broad as were as was the space between his shoulders, joints strong and broad. 
is the upper part of his chest and stomach free from hair, apart from that line, the forearms and shoulders uh, with small amount of hair. So, uh, sorry, the upper arms and the shoulders with a small amount of hair. The forearms, shoulders, and upper portion of the chest of the Messenger of Allah, <coughs> small uh, sort of amount of hair. Forearms were long, palms were wide, hands and feet fully fleshed. Fingers and toes of the Messenger of Allah were moderately sized. The soles of the blessed feet of the Messenger of Allah were well arched. The feet of the Messenger of Allah were smooth, such that water would run off them. This is how smooth the skin of the Prophet was. When he would walk, he would lift his feet sternly off the ground and then softly place them back upon the ground. When he would walk, he would walk, um, he would do so in long steps and when he would walk, it would seem as if he was descending from an elevated plane. Um, again, talking about directing his attention and facing fully to that person. And the only other thing to mention there is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He, when he walked, in one narration it says that the Prophet sallam, You know, before we said he walked at a brisk pace. In this narration, he says that when he walked with a group, he was often behind. If he walked at a brisk pace, how was he left behind? Or what about those narrations where uh, the Sahaba would say that we struggle to keep up? But those were specific narrations about smaller groups, about possibly just one or two Sahaba, possibly you know, just Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar and the Prophet This is when the Prophet you can understand it as him being in a large group, in an army possibly, or in a large group traveling, the Prophet would stay behind. Why? Yes, because the weak people, those who were, couldn't keep up, couldn't keep the pace, they would be left behind. Oh. And the Prophet ﷺ would stay behind to help them and to keep an eye on them out of compassion. Yes. Sayyidina Jabir bin Samra he says the Messenger of Allah had a beautifully rounded mouth, wide eyes and little flesh on the heels. Sayyidina Jabir bin Samra again, he says, I saw the Messenger of Allah on a night when the moon was in full splendor and he was dressed in a piece of red clothing. I would momentarily glance at him then at the moon, and eventually he said that came to the conclusion by Allah, he was more beautiful than the moons. Oh. Sayyidina Abu Ishaq, he reports that someone asked Barat bin Azir that was the face of the messenger of Allah like a sword, <coughs> and you know, implying that a sword is shiny and sharp, and he said no, that the face of the Prophet was like the full moon. And uh, why? Because the, the sharpness of the sword and the glint and glare of the sword is different to the, the nur you know, uh, of the moon and the light of the moon in that sense. And Abu Huraira, he says that the Messenger of Allah was, was of such clear radiance, it was as if he was forged out of silver. Uh, amazing way of describing the Prophet ﷺ, and his hair was slightly wavy. Sayyidina Jabir bin Abdullah, he says the Messenger of Allah, um, says that the Prophets were presented before me. I found that Musa al-Islam was of medium build, as if he was a man from the people of uh, you know, one of the tribes of Makkah, uh, of Arabia, the Prophet ﷺ described him as. You know, being slender, you see, he described, say, the Prophet ﷺ described Sayyidina Musa as being slender, and he said that, um, I saw Isa al-Islam and he, Urwa uh, <coughs> bin Mas'ud resembles him, one of the Sahaba. He said, you look like, or he looks like um, Sayyidina Isa al-Islam. And he says, I saw Sayyidina Ibrahim al-Islam and I resemble him. Out of all of you, I look like him the most. I resemble him the most. And um, Sayyidina Abu Tufel, uh, um, he says that I saw the Prophet ﷺ and there remains not a single person on the face of the earth who has seen him. He is, this is the last Sahabi to pass away. Uh, 111 Hijri, uh, his death, his, his passing is recorded. And when he described, he said, on the face of the earth today there is no one else who has seen the Prophet ﷺ. These are the only eyes left in this, uh, in this world, on this world that have seen the Prophet 
And he says that so someone asked him, describe him for me. And he said he was of a white and blossoming complexion and incredibly beautiful. And he was a man of moderate stature. Abdullah bin Abbas, he says that the Messenger of Allah had a beautiful gap <coughs> between his front teeth. When he would speak, light would be seen emanating from between his teeth. Some of the commentators have said that this is a metaphor that light is describing uh, the words of the Prophet But Imam Manabi, he says no. He says this was actual nur and light which shone from in between the, the teeth of the Prophet and this is something which Sayyidah Aisha anha, she's also described as well. And coincidentally, someone um, asked me recently well during Ramadan about uh, the, the, the comparison that Sayyidah Aisha anha, she draws with the beauty of the Prophet and the beauty of Sayyidah Yusuf And it's not a narration per se, there are, there, there are a couple of uh, uh, couplets of poetry that Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she has said about the Prophet And uh, uh, briefly translated, what they say is that those women who saw Yusuf al-Islam and cut their fingers, cutting through the fruit, they carried on and they cut their fingers, had they, Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, had they seen my beloved, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they would have torn out their hearts and cut through their hearts. This is, you know, this is the beauty of Rasulullah The bottom line being that anyone who has tried to describe the beauty of the Prophet has been lost for words. And this is why you know, the Prophet himself stated this, the Sahaba, and you know, the, the scholars, they state that the true beauty of the Prophet was never exposed to the world. Why? Because people, if it was, they would never have the ability to, uh, to behold it. They won't be able to sustain that beauty. They can't behold such beauty. It is never fully exposed. This is, you know, um, this is the beauty that is the perfection of Rasulullah yeah. And we'll conclude there. Everyone concluding with the words that I've never seen anyone more beautiful or as beautiful as him before him or after him. I ask you to wonder and think, ponder over those words. The conclusion that I've come to is that they were lost for words. There is no other way of describing the beauty of the Prophet. All they could say is, never seen anything as beautiful. And this is why, even, you know, Imam Ahmad Raza, in his uh, poetry, talking about the Prophet Sallallahu um, he eventually, he offers the same sentiment. He says, He says, I've had to, this is, I'm lost for words, and this is all I can say. You know, this is where I end it, I draw the line at this. Khalib ka banda, you are the servant of Allah and you are the master of the creation. That's all that and inshallah, we will continue uh, next week at the same time, quarter past seven. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa 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 ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار صلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين برحمة الله